Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. It's always an exciting week, and we certainly will be praying for your health and safety as well as your travels, if you are traveling. Speaking of traveling, this monk went on a long journey, and along his journey, he found a precious stone. He was quite thrilled because this stone was worth a lot of money and would provide him a lot of security and safety in his life. But as he continued along his journey, he found a traveler, and, and that, that traveler, traveler did not have his mic on. <laughs> the traveler walked up to the monk and said, could you spare some extra change? Can you give me something of yours? So the monk opened up his sack, and the traveler looked in. And he saw this precious stone, this gem, and he grabbed it. He says, I would like to have this stone. And the monk said, take it. The traveler left the presence of the monk overjoyed. And as he continued on for days, he sat back and reflected on how absolutely blessed he was. He was given this gem, and this gem would provide for him for the rest of his life. He would never have to worry about money or security or safety. He had all that he could ever desire. But after a few days, he started to become very depressed. And he realized that he didn't want that stone. And so he stopped along his journey and he doubled back and he went and he looked for the monk. He wanted the monk to take back the precious gem. He finally found the monk. And he says, I don't want this gem any longer. He goes, you did not give me that which is most precious. You gave me the gem I implore you, give me that which enabled you to give me the gem. The traveler realized there was something that was even more precious than the gem, the security that would be given to him. He wanted something that was most precious of all, the ability to give somebody that gem. We all want to discover true transformation, true wisdom. What is that ability to be able to give a gem of that worth away? How do you cultivate a character that has the ability to give a gem that could provide security and safety and all the wealth you could ever imagine so easily away to a random stranger. What is that quality that we seek? When you look at that quality, it is true transformation. The ability to be so sacrificial that you have something that is so precious that you can give away that which is precious. We want to look for that in this world, but in this world, we look for simple answers. We don't seek wisdom. We don't look for wild transformation, and we settle. When you can look for answers on Google, and we don't even go to the second page, we don't really seek that hard. When you can get a million results in 0.16 seconds. We don't really look for the truth. We just want to find easy answers. Jeremiah, though, says in 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. God 
promises us that we will find wisdom. We will find transformation when we go looking for it. We are wrapping up our series on wild transformation. But would you like to know what the Bible teaches To be that person, to be like that monk that could give away that precious gem so easily. What did he have that allowed him to give away the gem? I believe we find the answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 8 to 13. What is those virtues that would allow us to be like that monk? It says this. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought at like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall fully know, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. For us to cultivate true transformation, we need to have an abiding and strong faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, I believe you have the best definition of what faith really is. And if you are going to have a transformed mind, for you to really have something that is more precious than a gem, you have to have faith. That is the anchor that is going to help you have confidence in this world. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. But this faith is more than just an intellectual assent. It's more than just knowing facts and details about God. It is having trust in God when nothing makes sense and when you can't see what is coming around the bend. It's the ability to trust in God when you don't have all the evidence and you don't have all the facts. When you have uncertainty, faith gets you through the struggles and trials. It allows you to know where you are rooted and who you are rooted in. But it's not just believing, it's also doing it. James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If you want to see faith, faith is seen when there's nothing to see. Faith is observed when you can't observe, see the world. Faith is seen. God, when nobody can see God. But we have made a mistake in the church when it comes to teaching people about faith. We have believed that faith is developed and strengthened by more facts. That we think by you just knowing more of the minutiae, of the details about the Bible, that somehow you're going to have a stronger faith. If you can memorize the genealogies of Jesus and look in the Old Testament and know all who has begotten who, that somehow that's going to make your faith stronger. We have been mistaken by thinking that just knowledge alone makes faith stronger in the future. That is not the case. You have to have the core element elements of the gospel in order to strengthen you during the hard times. It is not going to be all the little tiny truths that you
you know that is going to give you that anchor during the storms and the trials of life. It's going to be the big shifts in the classic truths of Christianity that is going to make sure that you're strong. Nobody, when you think about faith and when you are struggling, says, oh, by the way, did you know that really obscure idea in that book of Leviticus? That really has provided a lot of comfort. No. What provides comfort is 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4. For I deliver to you as first importance... What I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. We don't need to know all the details of Jesus Christ, of God, and the history of the Israelites. We need to stand on one thing. Did Jesus rise from the dead? When you are struggling, when you are really weak in your faith, you need to go back to the core elements of the Bible. You need to go back to the classic truths of Christianity. That is what's going to make you strong. That's what's going to provide the foundation of your faith. It's not going to be random facts about God. Because if you believe in a God that raised his son from the dead, I think he can handle every other situation in life. If you believe in a God that sent his son to earth to die on the cross, you can believe that he can care for you as well. We need to rest upon the big truths of Christianity. That's what our faith is built on. The reason being is, it's the emotional elements of the gospel that give us the most confidence. It's interesting when they did this study and they showed this picture to random people and then they played the telephone game. Where you tell one person and then that person repeats that story back to another person. And they would take that to about six to seven individuals as they played the telephone game. They showed a picture of someone was shown a picture of a detailed situation. In one case, a group of people on the subway car. The car appears to be at the 8th Avenue Express and is going down Duckman Street. There are various advertisements posted on the car and five people are seated, including a rabbi and a mother carrying her baby. But the focus of the picture is two men having an argument. They are standing up and one is pointing the other at the other and holding a knife. As that story is told multiple times, in the very first telling, they get all the details right. All the details were included. But as it continued to be moved down the telephone line, the story's details were lost. And the emotional elements of the story were honed in on. They were sharpened. And so the people telling the story over and over again focused on the two men having the argument And holding the knife. The gospel story. For us to share it. We need to hone in on the core elements of the gospel. That's what our faith is based on. The second quality or virtue that we can have to be like that monk. Is hope. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses Uh, Verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I've been fully known. Hope is more than just optimism. Hope is being able to see into the future and knowing the outcome. That hope is the ability to see what God has planned For us, for you, 
It is the ability when all of life looks cloudy and foggy, you have the ability through hope to know what the future holds. That you may be looking into a mirror dimly, not seeing what's going to come down to your life. But with hope, you know that you're going to be able to see face to face. You're going to see clearly what Jesus has wanting for you. Hope is knowing that it's going to work out in the end. Hebrews gives a great definition of what hope looks like. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 9 to 12. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name and serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who faith and patience inherit the promises. There's promises that God has made for us and to us. And hope is the assurance that those promises will come. It's like playing one of those games on TV. It's like the price is right. You get called up and they always present the doors. And you have the selection of three doors and you have to pick. And you always know there's one big prize. And then there's kind of two duds that these two prizes are not really there. It's like a new car or a toaster oven. And you are sitting back and all the pressure's on you. And you sit back and you're like, oh, I got to win the car. I want the car. I don't want the blender. I want the car. And so you're wondering which one to choose. And there's all, it's just a one-third probability. You have no clue which door to pick. But when it comes to hope, you know, no matter which door you pick, as long as you pick faithfulness, you're going to receive the reward. You're going to be blessed. That you're going to be with God. That no matter what you choose... God is going to make you victorious. You're going to overcome. The monk knows that you can give away the precious stone because he has a hope for something more. And then finally, the way to have the mindset of the monk is love. It almost seems trite, I think, to end this series on wild transformation and say, well, if you really want to be transformed, true transformation is loving your neighbor as yourself. It almost seems like anticlimactic because we have heard that so many times in church. What's the solution to great transformation? How do we become more like Jesus? We need to love each other as ourselves. It almost seems that it has over been so overdone that it's not even shocking to us. But maybe it is so simple that when you go to that door and you knock, Jesus does answer it. And if you seek, you will find. That there's not some hidden mystery. There's not some truth on some mountaintop that you can't really find. It says in Matthew, if you will look, you will find. And it's right in front of us. It's right in our faces. If you really want to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, you're to love people. This is what Paul says. You have the Corinthians looking for how to be spiritually mature. They think the solution is spiritual gifts. If I can speak in tongues, if I have the gift of prophecy, then I am somebody who has been transformed in the image of Jesus. And Paul says that's not the case. True transformation is the ability to love one another. 
He says it and he concludes this section with this. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. It's so simple that it's so deep. That Christianity is summarized in the classic commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. There's not some hidden wisdom that we don't have access to. If you want to be transformed, love people. That's what transformation is. Why? Because that's who God is. 1 John 4, 7 to 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. I love in Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the Spirit, which we have heard over and over and over again. We can all sing the song. I could just sing it out of tune. But look at what it really says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, I failed English every single year in high school. But is is singular. You can't see this in the English. Or you can see it. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. And what does love look like? It should be almost like a semicolon. Love. And love is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. That Paul says... The fruit of the Spirit is not a bunch of fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And so if you have the fruit of the Spirit, you have love. And love is defined as these qualities. In the classic play, you have a character named Sean Valjean. And he comes, and he's kind of a criminal. And he comes to the priest, and the priest puts him up in the church. And Sean Valjean ends up robbing him. He steals all the silverware. He heads down the road, and some of the police, they catch him. And they bring him back to the priest. They assumed that he robbed the priest, which he really did. But the priest walks up to the door and he sees that he has been caught. And he brings out the candlesticks, the silver candlesticks. And says, Jean Valjean, why, why did you leave without the candlesticks? I wanted you to have the candlesticks as well. And the police are kind of baffled about this. Oh, well, we just, we just thought he stole this, the, the silver. We, we didn't know you gave it to him, priest. He goes, yes. And the candlesticks. Take the candlesticks. And he looks at them. And he says, this love has bought you. You are now a new man. And that's what God has done for us. The priest and the monk found something that was more valuable than gems and candlesticks. They discovered true transformation. Which is. Love. And God demonstrates this. By sending his son Jesus Christ to earth. 
And you have an opportunity to respond to this invitation of love. So that you can be transformed into being loving as well. If you will believe, confess, repent, and be baptized for remission of your sins, rise up out of that water to newness of life. You start your transformation. But it's a whole lifelong journey of learning how to love others. Why don't you start that transformation today as we stand and sing the invitation?